All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the seventh episode in our webinar series. Uh, this one is entitled Cultivating Biodiversity, Agricultural Landscapes and the Biodiversity Crisis. And I am, after a summer of not too many Zoom meetings and Zoom webinars and that sort of thing, I'm getting re-familiarized with using Zoom when I can't see anyone out that's out there. And assuming that everyone can hear me and that there are people out there that I'm talking to and I'm not talking to myself. So my name is Matt Mitchell. Uh, I'm a research associate in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at UBC. And I'm also associated with the Center for Sustainable Food Systems at UBC as well. So to start, uh, I would like to acknowledge the UBC Vancouver campus and myself as well. Um, I'm at the moment, I am situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge that you know the Musqueam people, as well as Indigenous uh, people around the world, um, since time immemorial, have fostered and stewarded um, the biodiversity in those places. Uh, and so I think it's important for us to take a moment and think about you know whose land we're on, and also um, what impact they've had on the species and the biodiversity around us. I know that each of you um, are also joining us from many places near and far. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional caretakers of those lands. Um, and I'd encourage everyone at some point to take a moment and situate, your, situate yourselves in place. Um, and to think about you know, whose territories do you currently reside? How have they historically managed those lands? Um, if you don't know whose territories you're on, um, there's a, I encourage you to begin that by learning about you know, where, where you are. I'm doing some research to find out whose land you're on. You, one way you can do that is um, by going to native-land.ca, which is here on this slide as well. It's a really great resource for um, discovering some of the different, uh, the, what territory you're on as well. Um, and feel free to put that in the chat or something as well, or if you have access to the chat, maybe people don't have access to the chat um, for this. So, I want to again thank you for joining us for the seventh installment of Farm to Globe, uh, Transforming Our Food Systems. This is a webinar series focused on focusing on what has become readily apparent, not only to our food systems experts, but to the general public increasingly, that there is an opportunity for major benefits through some much needed changes to our food systems. So we'll be exploring the most pressing issues our food systems face today and hoping to find some innovative solutions to these challenges. And I'm sure we will discuss some of those uh, today with our panelists. We'll also be focusing on social inequalities that are present in and exacerbated by all of these issues. And I hopefully we'll get to that as well today. Um, so please join us for the, these discussions, um, which we hope will drive action and help us discover what steps we need to take to transform our food systems from farm to globe. So this series is presented by the Center for Sustainable Food Systems at the UBC Farm. It's sponsored by uh, RBC Royal Bank, and it's also in partnership with the UBC Faculty of Land and Food Systems and the BC Food Web. So just for a little background, the Center for Sustainable Food Systems at UBC Farm um, at the UBC campus here in Vancouver is a teaching and research center, as well as a local to global food hub, which works towards a more sustainable food secure future. Their mission is to innovate from field to fork to achieve resilient, thriving, and socially just food systems for all. If you're in the Vancouver region and you haven't visited the UBC farm, um, I encourage you to. It's a wonderful place. Uh, they have markets, I think, Tuesday afternoons and Saturday mornings, um, some amazing food and vendors, and it's just a really nice place to hang out as well. The BC Food Web is a web portal project um, which aims to increase access and connection to current research and other resource materials. It also aims to encourage innovation between farmers and researchers to enable future project collaborations. Um, and then the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at UBC is a world leader in research and in teaching about a sustainable and healthy food supply. All right, I think that's most of the, the kind of background and, and um, all that sort of thing. So I'd like to really introduce our topic now for today. So our topic today is cultivating biodiversity agricultural landscapes and the biodiversity crisis. We're lucky to have Matt Sruda, Ida Guzman, and Sig Snap here today to discuss the loss of biodiversity and how agricultural landscapes could help the issue instead of cause further harm. Um, and just, I'll just really briefly mention, some of this may already be familiar to people um, on this webinar. Agriculture has a huge effect on biodiversity globally. You know, agriculture covers over one third of the terrestrial land on earth. It uses around three quarters of freshwater resources. 25% of our greenhouse gas emissions are from agriculture. 
the majority of animal biomass on earth is either humans or agricultural uh, livestock like cattle, pigs, sheep, goats, um, that sort of thing. It has a huge impact everywhere. Um, but that's not to say that every type of agriculture has an equal impact on biodiversity. There are lots of examples of ways where agriculture can foster and help um, steward biodiversity in nature as well. So hopefully we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, so after each panelist gives a brief presentation, about 15 minutes, we'll then move on to a Q&A portion of the webinar. So if you have questions for the panelists, please navigate to the question and answer tab at the bottom of your Zoom control panel, and you can share them with us. And you can put those in at any time during a, a, a presentation at the end. We'll generally, we'll save those questions until the end to answer. Um, you can also upvote other people's questions by clicking on the thumbs up symbol if it's a question that you think is really important or it is one that you were going to ask as well. If you'd like the opportunity to chat with other attendees, the chat feature is available. Um, but I will mention that if any inappropriate or offensive comments are not going to be tolerated by the, the um, people organizing this and that you'll be immediately removed from the webinar if we see anything like that. But I'm sure I'm sure that won't happen. Um, and last off, um, it, just bear with us if there's any unexpected technological difficulties or distractions or anything like that happens. Um, hopefully it'll be nice and smooth, but you never know. All right, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Um, first up, we have Matt Sruda. So Matt is a Master's of Science student in the Plant Science Program here in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. He completed his uh, Bachelor of Science uh, at UBC also in biology. He's long been interested in insects, biodiversity and sustainable agriculture. Insects are fascinating, so I'm, I'm looking forward to this. So this, is, this interest has led him to his current project. Matt is interested in the ways that habitat enhancements affect insect biodiversity and agroecosystems. So as agricultural intensification increases worldwide, natural habitat and biodiversity have seen declines, which can result in increased occurrences of pest outbreaks, um, and sometimes new pests as well we haven't seen. Of particular interest to Matt is the invasive spotted wing Drosophila uh, fly, um, which is an invasive species here actually in BC and causes a huge amount of damage to crops like blueberries, raspberries, and threatens the livelihoods of many growers. So there you go, Matt, and I'm really looking forward to hearing of uh, your presentation. All right, thanks for the introduction, Matt. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Matt Saruda. I'm a master's student here in the Plant Insect Ecology and Evolution Lab at UBC. And today I'm gonna to be talking a bit about my project, which is aiming to assess the impacts of habitat restoration in agroecosystems on the biodiversity of insects. So to start off, I'd like to give you some background about what exactly agrobiodiversity is. So this is kind of a broad term, but the basic idea is that it's the variety and the variability of all the organisms present in an agricultural ecosystem. So this includes the things that we use directly for food, things like crops and livestock, and then also the non-harvested species that support the production of those resources, things like pollinators and earthworms and things like that. Um, so it even includes the microorganisms that live in the ground that keep the soil healthy. Um, so when we talk about agrobiodiversity, we can talk about it on a couple different scales. So on the genetic on the genetic level, you can create a more healthy and stable ecosystem by planting a more diverse variety of crops. Um, so you could, for example, plant the wild tomato the wild relatives of tomatoes, um, or you could plant several different blueberry, blueberry varieties in with each other. Um, and then on a species or an ecosystem level, an ecosystem with more species present uh, generally performs more ecosystem services. Um, and these are things that the land does that benefits us. Um, things like water purification, pollination, pest control, nutrient cycling, and things like that. So in thinking about biodiversity, I'd like to do a little activity where I give you a minute or two just to think about what you think are the world's biggest threats to biodiversity at this point in history. So I'll take a second, you can do a little brainstorming and then I'll give you some answers. 
All right, so according to the International Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, there are five main drivers of species loss. So in order of least to most impactful, number five is the invasion of alien species. So as the connectivity of the world increases, we tend to bring in new species to new places where they disrupt the native species and the ecosystem services. Um, so in the past 50 years, the number of alien species introductions has doubled. So this is a growing problem in the modern world. Number four is pollution, which is a result of increased travel, trade, population, intensive agriculture, things like that. Number three is the broad phenomenon of climate change, where changing environmental conditions across the world are making survival much more difficult for many species. And number two is the exploitation of organisms. So that can take several forms. Uh, it could be the unsustainable practices of hunting or fishing or harvesting of timber. And then the number one threat to biodiversity, according to the IPBES, is changes in land and sea use. Um, and that's something that agriculture is partly directly responsible for. So like Matt said, over a third of the terrestrial surface on Earth is dedicated to agriculture. And between 1980 and 2000, over 100 million hectares of land became agricultural land. So as one of the biggest drivers of biodiversity loss, many researchers around the world are dedicated to finding ways to make agriculture more sustainable and to meet the needs of a growing population. So then one group of organisms that contributes a huge amount to agricultural productivity are insects. Um, because they're such a diverse group, they can play all kinds of different roles in an agricultural ecosystem, both good and bad. Um, so insect pests cause billions of dollars in damage to crops every year. But on the other hand, different insect species can provide pest control by eating or otherwise killing those pest insects. Uh, insects also provide important ecosystem services, things like crop pollination and decomposition of organic material that helps uh, cycle nutrients in the ecosystem. And then to give you an example of the different roles that insects can play, um, in this picture on the right, you can see um, this invasive fruit fly called the spotted ingrosophila. And this is a fly that will lay its eggs inside of the berries um, that grow in BC and all around the world. Um, and it causes a lot of damage to the crops. Um, but then on the left, you can see this tiny little wasp whose name is Leptopolina japonica. And this one lays its eggs in the larvae of the actual fruit fly, um, which effectively protects the crop by killing the pest. Um, so there's been a lot of speculation recently about declining insect biodiversity worldwide. And while this hasn't been conclusively shown, um, it does indicate a need for more insect biodiversity studies. So that's kind of where my thesis project comes in. Um, so our goal is to assess whether uh, semi-natural habitat restoration in agricultural landscapes can increase the diversity of beneficial insects. So the thought is that by providing these insects with floral resources, um, uh, you know, food and for habitat to live in, uh, we can boost the diversity of insects that are important for pest control. So to test this hypothesis, we've been traveling to 28 different field sites across the Delta region of British Columbia. Um, and each site has some kind of natural habitat amendment. And I'll go into a bit more detail in the next few slides about what those look like. So the first type of enhancement that we're looking at are what we're calling planted hedgerows. Um, these are assemblages of plants uh, implemented by the Delta Farmland and Wildlife Trust on the edges of fields that are meant to support beneficial insects. And to do this, uh, they've planted pollinator and beneficial insect friendly plants, things like wild rose, dogwood, and apple trees, things with a lot of floral resources that, that can support these beneficial insects. Other type of hedgerow that we're interested in are these remnant hedgerows. Um, these were put in place before Delta Farmland and Wildlife Trust was around, and they generally consist of uh, more weedy or invasive species, things like Himalayan blackberry. Um, English ivy, and then some of these bigger trees that don't necessarily provide a lot of uh, resources for these beneficial insects. So then another type of restored habitat that we're looking at are uh, what are called grassland set-asides. Um, these are agricultural fields that are purposely left uncropped for up to six years and planted with native grasses and legumes. Um, so these are planted with the, um, with the goal of maintaining proper soil health, but they have the added benefit of being 
really useful um, habitat for beneficial insects and also for a lot of native bird and mammal species in the area. Um, so then pollinator grassland set-asides are very similar to the traditional set-asides that I talked about in the last slide, uh, just with the added benefit of being supplemented with pollinator-friendly plants that boost the ability of the field to support beneficial insect species. So, and then finally, to get a kind of like a baseline of insect biodiversity in the area, we also sampled these pure control fields. Um, these are fields with uh, mostly grassy or weedy field margins without necessarily any intentional habitat restoration. So to get a full picture of the insect community um, on each of our fields, we used a wide range of sampling methods. Um, we used um, these yellow sticky cards, and these are helpful for catching things like um, small flying insects, things like flies and wasps and things like that. Um, we use pitfall traps and they're useful for capturing ground dwelling arthropods like beetles and spiders. And then we also used uh, apple cider vinegar traps. And these are really important for monitoring for uh, fruit flies, especially that um, invasive spotted ring drosophila that we're so interested in. Um, and then we also surveyed the vegetation in each of our transects to control for different, um, the different species of plants that might be present in the area that uh, have an impact on the types of insects that we're finding. So since we're still in the process of collecting samples and IDing them, I've only got some very preliminary results to show you, but what we've seen so far has been pretty interesting. Um, so from what we've analyzed so far, you tend to see that on average, you get about double the number of insects in planted hedgerows as opposed to the grassy margin control transects. Um, and because we haven't ID'd these insects yet, it's hard to say if you're seeing a lot more beneficial insects in the hedgerows as compared to pests, but it does show pretty solidly that these habitat restorations do provide habitat and resources for insects to live in. So we can see some similar results in the grassland set-asides um, where you see on average around 25 insects per sample when you go 50 meters into the grassland set-asides. And then as you can see, there's only about 11 insects per sample, 50 meters into a cropped field. Um, so this kind of makes sense because when you are sampling in a cropped field with only one kind of plant, it's unlikely that that's gonna be able to support a wide range of insects as opposed to these grassland set-asides where uh, you get a more diverse um, assemblage of plants that can support more different types of insects. So then looking more specifically at um, individual groups of beneficial organisms, you can see that planted hedgerows and remnant hedgerows support a significantly higher population of spiders. Um, and that's likely because of the more complex vegetation structure that you see in those hedgerows. Um, so this is good news because spiders are really great natural enemies of a lot of pest insects. So the more spiders that you see in a habitat uh, means that you're generally getting more pest control. So where we're going from here, um, we're still hard at work IDing our 3,000 plus insect samples that we have. Um, as you can see in the picture, uh, they're often quite diverse. Um, so they take a lot of effort and a lot of manpower to, uh, to get through sometimes. Um, so we are uh, yet to run um, a lot of statistics on our, on our data, but we're hoping to be able to see how vegetation structure correlates with insect diversity and abundance. Um, and then our hope is that we'll be able to determine which keystone plant species are really important for contributing to beneficial insect diversity. Um, and then hopefully we'll be able to inform growers um, what kinds of plants they can be planting on their properties to really boost um, the diversity of beneficial insects that you're seeing. So what can you do to support insect diversity? Um, so whatever kind of land you have access to, whether that's a farm or it's just a small garden. It's always helpful to plant some nice native flowering plants. Um, you'll attract all kinds of beautiful little insects like bees and butterflies. We got beetles um, and things like that. Um, it's also helpful to um, not mow your lawn or keep your field margins unmowed. Um, this gives insects both a place to live and things to eat. Um, and then finally, as minimal as you can get with pesticides, benefits all the bugs that you're likely to see around in your, in your garden or in your fields. 
So I would like to thank my funders, Delta Farmland and Wildlife Trust, um, IAF, and MITAX, um, plus Dr. Julie Carrillo, my supervisor, um, and everyone in the Pi Lab and our collaborators in the Kremen Lab at UBC. And thanks so much for listening. Perfect. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, that was a great presentation. I'm, I, I have questions for you at the end as well, and I saw some questions already from the audience as well. And I like the idea of, yeah, minimizing how much we mow our grass. We need to get a, we need to get UBC to think about where they can do less of that as well around here. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, thanks. All right, so uh, next up we have Ide Guzman, and Ide, please, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, and you can correct me <laughs> afterwards if I'm not. Ide is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of California at Irvine. Um, having deep family roots in agriculture, she is compelled to understand the socio-ecological linkages of diversifying farming systems. Her research draws from the knowledge produced in ecology, soil microbiology, pollination biology, and sociology of agriculture, so really interdisciplinary. For her PhD, Ida is working with small scale farmers or, or did work with small scale farmers if you're now a postdoctoral fellow, um, embedded in the monoculture landscape of California's Central Valley. Her research investigates how on-farm diversification practices impact soil health and link to other ecological processes like pollination um, in agroecosystems. Throughout her research, Ida aims to integrate social and ecological research approaches to support farmers rural livelihoods and ecological resilience. So I'm really interested to, to get this perspective of the ecological and the social. So um, yeah, go ahead. Thank you for um, the introduction. Yeah, I'm sort of like in between uh, finishing my PhD and starting a postdoc. Um, and thanks Matt for a wonderful presentation. Yeah, so today I'll be talking um, from fungi to bees in where I've worked, which is the San Joaquin Valley here in California. Um, I was part of the Kremen and Bose Lab. And as you all may know, uh, Claire is at UBC now. Um, and most of my work was in the ancestral and unceded land of the Trochenio speaking alone people. And I, you know, I always really struggle with trying to think about the framing of my research. And I think a lot of ecologists, um, you know, including myself, sometimes really go to a picture like this. And we're always like, you know, agriculture has, you know, really um, had such negative environmental impacts and, uh, you know, taking a very uh, negative approach. But one thing I've been trying to think a lot uh, through my work is um, a lot inspired by this image is by Ricardo Levens Morales, is how we can reimagine this landscapes um, to you know, work for people and for the environment. And here in the background is a sun-grown or monoculture of coffee and then superimposed is sort of a reimagined agroforest coffee system. And so a lot of my work um, kind of went right to what I like calling the belly of the beast, um, the California San Joaquin Valley, specifically in the Fresno area, which this arrow is pointing at. And a lot of people who may have driven through California sort of this is what they imagine when they think about this area super large scale agricultural region. Um, and, you know, it gets that rep. But also I think it's really important to remember that this landscape while, you know, super industrious in agriculture, um, it produces a lot of the uh, fruits and nuts consumed in the US and also across the world. And, you know, it's this landscape that's monoculture but produces a bunch of different diverse crops from almonds to pistachios to pomegranates, lettuce, et cetera. Um, but there's definitely some environmental impacts from that. Um, this uh, sunset is actually from a farmer down there and it's, it's dramatic, it's beautiful, uh, but it also reminds us of sort of the air pollution in the area that, you know, sometimes is attributed to these sunsets. And also, um, you know, the lack of natural vegetation in this region sort of just dominated by these industrial uh, farms. And also some of the social impacts, especially the sort of really negative and um, impactful uh, labor practices in the region. And also not to forget the water, this is an image of actually a town um, where I grew up in the area where it used to flood a lot growing up and this is a, it flooded, but um, in the recent years sort of with, um, or in the past years sort of this dependence on water, which is depicted by this image here of these canal systems has had a really big impact on water in the region, especially with the drought that, you know, uh, we had a last major drought uh, about 10 years ago and again in one. 
but I said I wasn't just going to talk about all the negative things um, related to agriculture. And uh, part of that is motivated by some of these images here, which um, are from either my family who farms in Mexico or uh, one of my friends farm um, sort of off of Highway 1 or this aquaponics system in Hawaii, sort of reminding us um, that there's a different sort of world possible when we think about agriculture. And one thing I, I love about these images is sort of the way humans are embedded in this landscape in, in a very different way than um, sort of what we've seen in the other images. And so a lot of my work has been motivated by this question, sort of thinking about this agricultural landscape, how do we make it work for both the environment and people? And this work has been in the Sunken Valley and it's taken me in a bunch of different directions. And I'll be briefly touch on, on these throughout the presentation. One, I've looked at how farm management um, in the area affects pollinators. I've also looked at how it affects um, AMF communities, their connections, and then also the way drought affects um, farm management in the region. Um, I'll briefly touch on these different components and not go into too much detail, but I'm happy to take questions. So, uh, you know, taking this area, like I said, people usually think of this landscape as an industrial landscape. But actually, if you sort of go into this landscape and you drive around, what you'll find is, you know, these little hot spots of biodiversity um, on farms. So these are really small scale diversified farms that are embedded within the landscape. And uh, with a friend, we went out there and we uh, uh, took some footage of the farms. And these sort of these land, these small scale farms are sort of sprinkled throughout this uh this region and tend to be really small, but on this landscape, they tend to grow 50 to 100 different crops, everything from ginger to jujube, gourds, and much more. But even though these small scale farms are around two dozen farms, they actually represent less than 1% of the land in the region. So it's many little tiny farms across this region. And so um, who are these farmers? And something I always like sort of putting up front and something we can keep in mind throughout the presentation, the predominantly immigrant refugee farmers who are farming on sort of on the margins, and that can be both social and ecological land that, you know, wasn't very productive and let go, or, you know, they have a very, you know, tenuous uh, rent, like leases on their land. So, um, and on land that used to be monocultures for the most part. And here's just some beautiful images of all the different crops grown on the farms. And then these are some, um, some maps we drew up because a lot of people are like, are there really that many crops? And so we, we went out with the with an undergraduate student and we created these maps for these farms. And so throughout my uh, presentation, a lot of it would be centered on comparing monocultures to polycultures or these more diversified farms. And part of it is motivated by sort of looking both the effect of farm management and above ground diversity and below ground diversity above ground meaning crop diversity, but also pollinators and other insects like Matt talked about, and below ground, fungi, bacteria, and including insects below ground. And we know a lot from the literature that this biodiversity is linked to multiple ecosystem functions and services, including food, erosion control, soil health, and much more. So, you know, when we do simplify landscapes, we can, um, you know, have, we know it has the negative impact on the environment and people. But taking the region that I've been working in, working, what happens when we diversify the farms? What happens when we go from you know, these really big monocultures and go the opposite direction? So first I decided to look above ground. And I decided to look at pollinators um, in this region and not just any pollinators. So I was specifically interested in specialist pollinators that specialize on one, on one pollen source. And um, I specifically focused on squash bees. Um, and squash, so it's this system. So squash tend to ha have separate uh, flowers that one has uh, pollen and the other flower receives it to then produce a fruit. They actually have just a short window of time to, uh, to be pollinated and that's really early in the morning and usually flowers close by midday. So they're only open for one day. And the squash bees um, really fit really well within that. Um, what they, and they depend on the squash pollen. Um, they're active at sunrise, so really early in the morning when these flowers open. And sometimes at the end of the day, they actually end up sleeping in the flowers, which is really cute. Um, and they've actually expanded its range. It's from like Central America to the Northeast of the US. Um, it, these squash bees are found with, with the uh, cultivation of squash. But going in, I was curious, okay, 
if squash bees depend on, on squash, will we find more squash bees on monocultures that have a bunch of squash pollen or on polycultures that may have a limited amount of squash pollen? And so we kind of went in this prediction, yeah, maybe we'd find a lot of honeybees because they're everywhere. And we'd probably find a lot of squash bees on these, on these fields, but perhaps on the polycultures, we would find you know, lots of honeybees, but perhaps not as many squash bees as the monocultures and um, perhaps more of these wild bees. And so to do that, we took surveys really early in the morning. Like I said, these bees wake up really early and the flowers were open really early. And we did the same sort of sampling scheme across all these farms. And what we find is that actually crop diversification supports pollinators. We find um, nearly two times more squash bees on the polycultures and the monocultures, which is contrary to what we expected. We also find is that the surrounding agriculture land increases um, there's less there's less squash bees on monocultures, um, but much more on um, on polycultures. And on top of that, although not significant, we find that squash bees decrease throughout the day on on monocultures, but don't change that much on polycultures. So overall, they support specialist pollinators. So instead of what we predicted, we do find a lot of honeybees. I'm not showing that data, um, but we find a lot more squash bees on the polycultures and also wild bees. And this could be for a number of reasons. Um, one of the things that I think is happening is that these small scale farms are not just planting squash in one go. A lot of the squash monoculture farmers will plant squash for just one go, then let it fallow. But the squash uh, polyculture farmers, they're planting squash sort of throughout the year from like summer to winter squash, sort of rotating uh, it throughout the field. Um, and they also, one thing, um, is that squash bees also, see, also need nectar. So not only do they need squash pollen, they also need nectar for sort of the, um, for energy. And so the polycultures are perhaps uh, providing more resources for them. And there's also a number of other studies that a lot of people ask me like pesticides and that could be playing a role, but we didn't test any of those. We kind of just wanted to see what's going on on these farms. And then I took my attention below ground because I always think that when a farmer uh, implements a practice, it doesn't just change one thing, it changes multiple things. So I was really curious about another group of mutualists, um, the Arbuscus and Mycorrhiza fungi. And um, they're really um, important um, AMF and they've actually, uh, important fungi in the system. They've actually been around for 450 million years. So they're super old and they supposedly help the plants get onto land. And part of that is because they formed a symbiotic relationship with a lot of plants. It's more of the rule rather than the exception. And they associate within the roots and then they help plants take up these really critical nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus that the roots might not be able to reach entirely. And they also, apart from nutrient uptake, they help plants with a bunch of other uh, functions, including drought, tolerant, uh, salt tolerance, heavy metals, uh, pollution, et cetera. So again, how does managing crop diversity affect AMF diversity? So we set out to test, um, to look at this question across these farms, focusing on eggplant, and we took samples of roots and soil and sequenced them. And again, um, with the same question, you know what happens when we've had a field that's been a monoculture, what happens when you put a lot of crops? Uh, you know, with the and I kind of was always like perplexed, you know, are we just going to see an impact of these monocultures and, you know, they reduce the AMF diversity that these polycultures might not be able to, you know, replenish it, or might we see that? Um, and so here you'll see a figure and the y-axis is sort of telling us how diverse. And what we find is nearly twofold on average of AMF, different taxa on polycultures. And so what this tells us is that plant diversity or crop diversity in fields um, could really support and bolster these communities and provide these multiple functions on these farms, even on farms that have been intensively managed in the past. And so what we find is that on-farm diversification supports specialist pollinators. They also support um, these mutualists, these beneficial microbes below ground. And so we're getting a little tiny closer to sort of thinking about like, uh, looking at this question, um, you know, and the fact that they can support multiple functions. But in this landscape, we're also, um, you know, really facing this issue of drought um, in this landscape. And, and so the next thing I decided to look at, how is drought affecting the farm management in this region? Especially because, you know, there was a lot of predictions that farms might not be able to survive the drought. And so I was curious which farms have and which have, farms haven't. 
And because a lot of the literature says that on-farm diversification, all these different practices might bolster ecological resilience, we went with the prediction that these diversified farms that I've been working with might persevere in the face of drought. And so we went on and tested that we documented um, with remote sensing um, the different crop types that were there, but also these polycultures and mapped the change or loss throughout time. And contrary to our, our predictions, what we find is nearly a fourfold decrease of these diversified farms to the last major drought. And actually it's, it's super linear and a lot of the land, the figures not shown here was actually converted, a lot of this diversified land was converted to really water intensive crops, including grapes and almonds. And at the same time, almonds also increased um, in this landscape. So I think I said in the beginning, you know, let's not forget who the farmers are in this land, they're predominantly immigrant refugee farmers. And so I think one of the takeaways when we think about, you know, increasing biodiversity in these agricultural landscapes is that we also, and especially in the face of this climate crisis, is that there's multiple socioeconomic factors at play. And moving forward, we need to sort of incorporate that to sort of support more resilient agroecosystems. Agri and so with that, um, you know, it's really brief and quick presentation. I just want to acknowledge all the farmer participants and students who've helped me. Thank you. Great presentation, Aide. That's That was really interesting. And I love that you looked at above ground, below ground, and some of the changes with the drought. And that's challenging, too, to do that much stuff and to measure those different things. So um, really great work. So I'm more questions coming in, too. So I'm uh, excited to delve into those uh, after SIG's talk. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> our final speaker is uh, Siglinda Snap. Um, SIG is a professor of soils and cropping systems ecology in the Department of Plant, Soil, and Microbial Sciences. And she's also the Associate Director of the Center for Global Change and Earth Observations at Michigan State University. SIG's research interests include agricultural systems, sustainable crop management, integrated nutrient management, and soil health. Uh, a key focus in her lab is harnessing biology through cover crops and diversity to enhance carbon sequestration, nitrogen fixation, and phosphorus cycling. She investigates ecologically sound design of agriculture through multidisciplinary approaches, long-term field experimentation, participatory action research, and systems modeling. Um, SIG is committed to innovative extension approaches in the upper Midwest and Africa and engaged learning. Through participatory action research and extension, she supports sustainable agriculture and local capacity for climate change adaptation and resilience. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to your talk as well, SIG. So yeah, go right ahead. Thank you, Matt. And it was really great to see this work that's really from both of you, Matt and ID, that's embedded in and and kind of at the cutting edge of, of, of where we're learning about biodiversity. So uh, this will be a more of a bigger picture one. And uh, I just uh, think these go together so well. I really believe in um, acknowledging where we stand, indeed, as I stand on the uh, Three Fires Confederacy in Central Michigan. So uh, we've also heard earlier um, from Matt that about the landscape um, about diversity being at multiple levels, landscape, genetic. Uh, I'm going to focus a lot on genetic diversity and functional diversity. I'm originally a plant physiologist from UC Davis, so kind of single plant. So I've learned through multidisciplinary work and uh, to think about broader um, landscape diversity, but I thought I would just situate myself mostly within how do we support because I think we keep hearing about all the benefits but now let's think a bit more about how we support this because landscape diversity there is some well trodden pathways uh successful or not but we heard about some of them hedgerows uh, policies can support conservation of agricultural land set aside uh throughout North America U.S. and Canada uh certification organic farming should not be forgotten because in fact, there's study after study has shown less pesticide use, higher landscape diversity, including in California, which is already uh, in some, by some measures quite diverse, but not the landscape level. So we have ways forward, I would say, in order to, um, to at least let farmers that have enough land and have the resources, obviously some farmers don't have access to land. So there's certainly bar barriers, but we have some ways forward. There's also some interesting innovations around because crops and livestock have gotten so segregated. Uh, there's been work uh, in Michigan, for example, in Maine, uh, where we promoted, supported farmers cross uh, sharing their land and uh, uh, some, agricultural 
uh, innovators, entrepreneurs started up a compost uh, facility, which was <laughs> proven by economists to be uneconomic, but they did it. And so now there's some integration of uh, manure from these more concentrated family farms, but somewhat specialized like dairies um, into compost and then back. And then, as I said, some potato growers, vegetable growers who want to see their land more diversified, they know they can't just keep growing potatoes and carrots and things right on top of each other. And so they, they send it for grazing for a while, but it requires, you know, really family farm integration. So there's so many interesting models out there, again, at the landscape level. But the big picture, as you know, which is quite worrying, is that although there's some diversification in terms of commodities are being grown in new places, but they're in intensified ways. And certain commodities in North America, this is a recent paper and another one that came out just in 21 is showing this, that corn, soybean, as you might not be surprised to hear, uh, over in the yellow here and purple are just dominating the landscape. Wheat goes up and down, but the subsidies tend to promote, if your land is not too marginal, more marginal land tends to go into wheat. You go corn and soybean. All these other commodities going down. And another challenge about this is even if you want to add cover crops or some sort of hedgerows into your environment, it's very difficult with corn soybean because they uh, fill a different niche. Wheat is more friendly and other the small grains uh, to cover crops even. So there's really negative complications of, from this. So this is the types of forms of organism diversity I'm gonna talk about, genetic diversity over time and space. And then I really wanna talk about functional groups because I think we're missing some functional groups. So think about that as we go forward. What do I mean by that? We've heard about this polycultures. Uh, we, we've heard about monocultures. Is there something missing? Uh, even in these polycultures of vegetables in particular and fruit types. What could I possibly mean by that? So monocultures more and more and simplified systems such as corn, soybean, we are finding they have many negative, and you don't have to be told this, but I think that this recent scientific, scientific uh, reports should be more widely uh, quoted that all these negative externalities of focusing on corn. I'm particularly concerned about this because what model are we promoting in Africa? Your taxpayer dollar, even Canada is somewhat promoting this, or certainly in the US, there is this focus on intensification, what's so-called sustainable intensification, but as long as it's maize-based, I feel that there's all these negative externalities, water quality, hardly external if you live somewhere where you're well could be contaminated. Air quality, obviously climate change implications, soil loss. So these are being quantified. And I think that this work particularly for Minnesota should be more widely quoted. Other work uh, a few years ago, there was sort of a natural experiment. What do I mean by that? Well, much of the Midwest, the Corn Belt, became more heavily dominated, 20% increase in corn. Why? 2008, 2009, sorry, this was published then, but 2006 was when the experiment happened. It was a biofuel boom, right? Ethanol, a new market, prices went up for corn. So farmers were told, you'll improve your soil health because you look at all those residues you're putting on top of the soil. That's not true. It turned out soil carbon didn't jump from that. So it's not so simple as just add more biomass, you get more soil. So that's a myth that's continually having to be uh, shown that there's actually evidence against that. You need diversity for soil health. As we saw the mycorrhizae work, that was fantastic because I originally am a below ground person. Um, but also above ground, here are biocontrol services, basically aphids, uh, predators for aphids that keep them under control. Even just having soybean in the landscape will improve your predators and you can control your aphids. When areas of the upper Midwest, from Michigan to Iowa, up through um, Wisconsin were monitored for aphids and for their uh, beneficial insects that control them. And they found that guess what? As areas that were growing more and more corn in those particular years, when there was this jump in corn production, a biocontrol services, in other words, aphids were not controlled. So really interesting work needs to be told again that uh, too much corn is a problem. And also, there is quite a lot of talk about regenerative ag, about conservation agriculture. Again, in Africa, it's being pushed so hard. 
And yet I want to point out this meta-analysis. So many, many studies went into this, showed that it wasn't the conservation tillage so much that improves soil carbon. It was diversified conservation tillage. So only if you had at least two and often three or four crops, you know, those deep roots, again, legume roots, build soil carbon, not so much corn roots, not surprisingly, but it's, it's important to remember that you need the diversification because conservation tillage, which is so often promoted as the way to improve soil carbon as a fundamental soil health benefit and water quality benefit, and obviously climate change mitigation, as well as adaptation strategy, conservation tillage alone does not do it. So don't forget this meta-analysis because this really, people uh, overlook this and just talk about conservation tillage or reducing your disturbance which sounds logical. You're not making oxygen into the soil and having carbon dioxide go off. Well, actually it's about the conversion of biomass to soil carbon sequestration. And that depends on diversity, microbial and well, the plants and their associated microbes, let's say. So how do we, okay, we, we agree for all these good things. Let's think about how can we get to more genetic diversity? How do we get each farm growing more different crops? We saw that farmers want to do this often uh, and some are managing to do it. That was so interesting in, in uh, California to hear how some have managed to do it in one of the most monoculture intensive landscapes. Uh, so, well, as long as society keeps looking at price of food and commodities, convenience, you know, access uh, to that uh, certain processed foods, meat products that are produced through these commodity chains, so-called efficiency, thinking only about mechanization, uh, production per area, not thinking about um, labor, human welfare, animal welfare, thinking about biodiversity, our theme today. So we can, we're gonna end up with, even in the seed companies, so access input markets, we're going to get end up with consolidation, which is what's occurred, and inexpensive seed, but limited seed varieties, few that are locally adapted. But if we tried to promote, if, if we had an explicit metric in our policies for thriving local community businesses, or that, that gardeners and farmers could all access local varieties, um, then we might see these local seed companies surviving and providing this. And right now there's huge demand for seed uh, because gardeners gardening in this COVID time is, is uh, thriving luckily. So that's input markets. What about output markets? Again, farmers say, well, I have nowhere to sell this because they are trapped on supermarkets and commodity chains. We do get inexpensive food. We shouldn't ignore that. But is it nutritious? Are local farm families thriving? Maybe not so much. So the subsidies right now particularly in the US promote corn and soybean. Rest of the world, they promote other commodities, but we have happened to have these uh, floor prices that particularly privilege those two crops because they go into these livestock and commodity chains for soda pop and everything else. So that's what we're getting, more corn and soybean and all of the inputs that needed with them and then all the suppression of insect diversity of other types of diversity. So that's really disturbing. And I just think it's important to think about what metrics are we using. So I promised I would talk a little bit about functional diversity. And by that, I mean both life history form. So how many annuals do we have in the landscape? How many perennials? How many biennials? So, so not just having diversity, different crops like many, like broccoli. Broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts, those are all the same species. They're not really functionally diverse, are they? They're, they're all, and yet we have selected for some varieties. So in some ways they have some diversity in terms of biochemical diversity in their tissues. So interesting, humans have made them more diverse in some ways. Um, nutrient acquisition, the classic diversification functional combination is a legume, which fixes nitrogen as well known, but it also accesses phosphorus. Those are the two most important nutrients for improving production in the planet. Um, nitrogen and phosphorus. And then also, as I said, legume roots have this special role for soil carbon sequestration, somewhat overlooked. And then grasses, grasses grow fast. They are good at taking nitrogen and water and turning it into grain. So cheap, inexpensive, 
good calorie source if, um, when you're looking for that. Legumes provide the protein. So they're very complementary. They even have complementary amino acids if we go to that level. So what might be pathways? And this is just my speculation. Um, again, I think as long as we keep having metrics, and I, I did recently write a paper on this as more of a perspective piece, that if our metrics are prized convenience efficiency, we will get these high yielding species. What do we mean by high yielding? These are sometimes called high harvest index. Basically, 50% or more of the plant, 60% in many some cases, is all in grain. They're very short, and you don't see me, but I'm four foot ten. So if I stretch, so I don't nothing against shortness. I think it's it's very efficient actually. But short means that they don't have straw. So we no longer have the deep roots. They just put everything into grain. And so these are functionally this very annual short plants. But what about if we want environmental services? What about farmer well-being? Well, farmers having to cut short wheat in Africa where they hand cut it, or farmers that want to improve their soil health. If we keep having space, species and varieties that are shorter and shorter, will it improve um, habitat? Will it improve soil and water health? Because they don't have necessarily have the roots. They don't have the legumes there because we're focusing on things that produce high yields. And cereals, as I said, grasses are great at that, but you're missing other types of diversity. So even within legumes, this story, and this is my work in Africa, uh, I've given a few examples from temperate uh, Michigan as well. So annuals, this is what we focus on and farmers and all of us do need these, beans, peanuts, soybean, even corn, They're, they grow fast and very quickly give us some food and something to market. But often to get real ecosystem services, there's a lot of talk about agroforestry. It's even in the carbon uh, sequestration mitigation, uh, these um, protocols, farmers are, and other community members are sometimes paid to plant trees. And that's either conservation tillage or trees are, the way the world is seeing agriculture can improve carbon sequestration. I would say that actually it's even more effective and more farmer friendly and better for the environment, more diverse, if we also include bushes and vines, so short-lived perennials, somewhat overlooked. Often these are women's crops. Um, I think they're for more integrated, like alfalfa for crop livestock, integrated farms, cover crops like red clover, climbing bean, more of a garden, vegetable. All of these things can improve the soil in all these ways, and yet they're, they're overlooked by these treaties and by the United Nations and by agricultural policy, because we go all the way to agroforestry. This is shown here as this bush here, Trifosia, is growing in with the corn. Interesting, but farmers have actually rejected this in Africa, because I think it's just so much work to have to keep cutting it three or four times. Otherwise, these trees take over, and they're just providing soil fertility. They aren't fruit trees. So how are farmers supposed to invest all this into just this tree that gets in their way? Maybe it builds soil carbon, but they aren't yet seeing the benefits from that. It takes longer. So I think perennials are part of the picture, and I'm going to talk about perennial grains at the end here. Um, so there's a lot of types of perennials, but we're really missing things like climbing beans that can grow for nine, even 12 months, and things that grow for two years, biennials. So if you just take a few legume species, again, when I talked earlier about harvest index. So most of improved crops are in this 60, 50% harvest index. Half of the plant is going into grain. Soybean is a classic example of this. Uh, short duration ground is just a short season, uh, early harvest peanut is what we would uh, call it here. Uh, also cow pea. So there's all these other out there, things that actually farmers, local, uh, indigenous varieties often, farmers are often on the side keeping these going. And yet they're not included in many, except for maybe all the way in agroforestry systems, which are promoted by some projects, NGOs. But many farmers try these intermediate things, kind of combine these high nutrient content, soil improving diversity that you could grow right in with corn and other types of um, cereals. And they provide more benefits than these short duration ones. I'm not saying we shouldn't have short duration crops, not by anything. I'm just saying they shouldn't be 90% of the landscape. We should looking at 
these other things. Now, in some parts of the world, if they have enough space, farmers do put in cover crops. Um, they may do rotational diversity. There's, you know, regenerative agriculture with uh, grazing systems. If, but again, you have to have enough space for that. Much of the Af Africa work, I, uh, farmers I work with have very small, like an acre or less to produce enough food for their family. So they're really looking for things that don't compete too much. So legumes, especially pastures are very difficult for them to maintain or trees. So we have these different types of mixtures that I would say particularly farmers have pioneered. And uh, we should definitely be having policies and research to support them and then Again, uh, as consumers, when we buy organic uh, foods, often or local from our farmers markets, or support policies such as hospitals and schools, getting some proportion of their food locally, all these are ways to help farmers who are already in, interested in trying to diversify because it allows them market and Organic farming, again, is somewhat sometimes overlooked because it can be very intensive and, and commercial. But uh, so many studies have shown that it reduces pesticide use. Absolutely. It increases diversity of landscape and at the field and farm level. So we shouldn't overlook that simple way of buying organic. So I'm going to leave you with, again, this functional group that's been missing, these semi-perennials, and something that is only starting to be developed, particularly pioneered by the Land Institute. And I put their website here at the bottom. Um, and that's called perennial grains, such as perennial wheat. We have done some work that's showing that uh, here on the left, that nitrate leaching can be massively reduced by organic production or by growing a perennial grain. And in fact, if you combine, if you organically grow a perennial grain, you will get almost zero nitrate leaching or just go organically, you'll get a huge reduction. And adding a perennial even into a high intensive agriculture. And so by perennial wheat, what I mean is annual wheat usually grows for like nine months over one winter. Perennial wheat can grow for three or four years. So we just sow it once, it builds these massive root systems. It still is a work in progress. A lot of people think there is a perennial wheat. We've been able to work with some genetics, but they are not yet varieties that thrive, at least in Michigan. But there's something called Kernza, which is related, which is an intermediate wheat grass, which does thrive and farmers are starting to find markets for it. I really hope that perennial wheat gets developed because we know how to use wheat as bread. The life, um, you know, it is a very important staple along with other things, but still perennial wheat would be a wonderful uh, something that we could farmers could use. And one thing really interesting is we have found time and time again, that perennial wheat has a lower yield because as I said, it's still being developed. And yet farmers pointed out, they don't care. They don't care if it's low yielding, it's higher yielding than a cover crop and they could put it all along rivers or they have ways they would deploy it in the landscape if we had such a thing. So again, a plea for, for policies that think and support new markets and I think as researchers, we should be thinking beyond just cover crops, but providing options, different types of crops that would diversify the landscape and then would help provide this habitat for all the biodiversity we heard about earlier, like the different insects. So thanks again for this opportunity. And I really look forward to this discussion. Great, thanks so much, Seg. That was a, a nice, I liked how the progression of the talks <laughs> went to a little more broader by, with yours and some really great points. Um, so I think we now are going to move to the Q&A portion of the webinar. Uh, we have about, I think about 25 minutes for that. I'll be asking the panelists some um, curated questions um, as well as some of the live audience questions that we received as well. My guess is we were not gonna get through all of them, but we'll hopefully get through as many as we can. Um, a reminder, if you haven't um, been able to get there yet to navigate to the Zoom control panel and select the Q&A uh, function to input your questions, um, as well as upvote others as well. So I'm going to I'm going to start with um, one of my own questions right now, and it, this builds a little bit on on Sig's um, talk, but I also want to get the other panelists views on this is around the what they see as the biggest barriers to some of the solutions that they've talked about, whether that's 
um, you know, habitat enhan enhancements, whether it's growing polycultures, um, whether it's these metrics, like how do we get these sort of solutions to actually be um, taken up by farmers? And so I'm curious about what the barriers are. Are the barriers policies? Are they the barriers to farmers themselves? Are the barriers economic? Um, and I don't know who to start with, but maybe let's start with, with Matt, do you have any feeling about that? And um, if you haven't gotten to that point with the farmers and understood it as well, that's fine, so. Yeah, sure. I mean, I can talk about it a little bit. Um, I think maybe one of the biggest barriers for us is um, convincing the farmers to implement these kinds of things. They can be quite costly to implement these kinds of um, habitat enhancements. Um, and I think also a barrier is the communication. Um, sometimes I feel like there's a barrier between us as researchers and the ability of us to communicate our results to the public um, and to the farmers. Um, because I feel like if farmers don't understand why they're doing something, they're going to have a harder time wanting to do it. Um, so, and, and then one, one other problem that I kind of see is that at least in insect biodiversity studies that I've read, sometimes you get inconsistent results where sometimes you see higher pest numbers even in these restored habitats. Um, so I think that when you see those kinds of negative results, sometimes they can be uh, discouraging to farmers um, and that can be kind of a tough thing to overcome. So I think you kind of just need to um, communicate with them in kind of a plain language way and show them that this, this is a possibility and this does work in a lot of situations. Yeah, every, people want that certainty and that what they do is going to always be positive, which isn't always possible. Uh, Aide, how about you in the, like in California and that sort of thing with the, those, those small scale farmers? Um, I feel like one thing I always come back to is land access, um, just because um, I know I was talking about like perennials, but like, for example, with that, you would need, you know, a long term lease to be able to sort of implement some of those practices. Um, so I, a lot of it come, I, I always come back to sort of, you know, you know, really strong land tenure or access to land um, for part, part of it. The other thing too, is I always think to farmers, um, each farmer has their own personality, right? And a lot of the farmers who grow a lot of different, like really diverse farms and have these polycultures, a lot of them end up selling to a farmer's market. But I've met farmers who are like super shy they like don't really want to do the whole like interaction with with consumers and so you know and i guess what i'm going with that is sort of like market diversification having you know places where they can sell these crops that there's they're able to um uh implement practices for that um yeah i think sometimes i usually go to that and then specifically to uh farmers who may not speak english directly is having workshops and resources that are in their language as well uh, Sig, do you have any? Yeah, yeah, no, I like this point about uh, land access. I think about that a lot because in Africa, we're always told, yeah, that, you know, women's access to land is a real problem. And then I think about how many growing numbers of farmers in the U.S. are women, and they don't have access to. There's been some showing, particularly California, is uh, we have huge land consolidation issues. It's a really good point. And obviously, many farmers um, uh, don't have uh, are workers on farms and, and don't have access at all. Um, and actually, uh, Eddie, one reason I work on semi perennials bushes and these uh, short lived grains that are just two or three years. Some people call this the weak perennial vision and they really critique it. And I'm really all about things that have been overlooked. We haven't developed these two year and that or three year crops that provide flexibility for farmers, particularly those that are renting land. Um, particularly those that are interested in, in nutrition, but in short term, they don't necessarily want to go all the way to trees. So I feel there's this whole neglected middle ground. Maybe partly again, because the bushes are, are often overlooked, the vines are overlooked, and yet we could many species, everything from soybean um, to uh, wheat have these intermediate life forms out there, we could easily develop them, um, but they have not been. Um, and I think it's interesting too that in Africa, women often can plant bushes, um, such as pigeon pea, which is a, a form of legume pulse, and so it provides food. It grows for only two or three years, and women can plant it because it's not seen as a tree. They're not claiming long-term tenure. And you knew, if you know my work, that you know I bring up pigeon pea at some point. 
Um, I was I, love- I was pretty sure Vision V would come up some way. Sorry, was someone else going to say something? I was just going to say, I, I, I think I really love the idea of semi-perennials. Some of the farmers I work with um, grow lemongrass, which is actually like a two-year crop. And I've always really wondered sort of, you know, there's this, like you're saying, there's this gradient, right? And we need all of it, right? We don't just need the sort of the, you know, this crop or this or these. Um, yeah, so I completely agree with you and sort of having that flexibility in that like in-between zone. Yeah, it feels like there's a, there's sometimes it's the limit of our imagination about what we think agriculture is and what it can look like sometimes. And yet farmers are doing these things that they often are not published. Like we were asked to, to document if perennial grains were in Africa. And in fact, or was there any demand for perennial grains seeing as a brand new thing? Well, my postdoc, Paul Roger, who's now at McKnight Foundation, an agroecologist there, I'm so excited. Anyways, uh, he, uh, showed that farmers were actually using sorghum as a biennial. They were using pigeon pea as a uh, three-year crop in some places. So somewhat overlooked, but um, you know they are there if we talk to farmers and indigenous people. Great. Um, so I wanna, I wanna get to some of the questions from the uh, attendees as well. And so I wanna maybe expand a little bit more on, on the social and the labor practice part of things. And there's a question here that um, it's came up during Eddie's talk, but I think it probably is relevant to everyone is, um, Eddie, you briefly mentioned issues with labor practices and the re- reality that many of these farmers are immigrants who face a unique set of challenges. And so this person would love to hear from the panelists how they incorporate social justice work into their research, or maybe if they haven't, how they would love to do it in the future, that sort of thing. So. Maybe ID. Do you want to start with that one? Since yeah. It was, yeah. I, I, yeah. I guess I'll start. Yeah. I think the landscape I work I, I work in is like super complex because there's so many social like injustices related to literally the landscape from drinking water quality to labor practices to um, the infrastructure in between. Um, and I always think about this in terms of like the social justice work and like advocacy um, that I can do. Um, and I, I just sometimes like I, I guess what I do, I do get really involved with um, like on the ground, um, like agroecology organizations, uh, one to put on workshops or to participate in different sort of panels, like to um, like uh, there's this sort of environmental justice org that I, I've done. At the same time, I, I really wish there were more researchers and people working in this region. I sometimes feel like sometimes these like. Um, like very industrialized ag regions sometimes get ignored and in that. So um, it's something that I feel like, that's why I say, I feel like my work is on like a little tiny sliver of what this question is so big and there just needs to be more work and in, including in my own, yeah. Matt or Sig? Um. I I haven't thought about this question too, too much, but um, some of our lab members um, have been uh, working on outreach with um, some indigenous communities in in the area. So they've been going to some of the schools in the indigenous nations and giving talks about how insects are so important and so cool and how they can benefit um, agricultural uh, ecosystems. And I think that's just a really cool thing to do to um, try to get Get some public outreach to um, the the people in the area. I would, that's that's great, and I would love to see as well that it's not just um, researchers going to indigenous communities to learn, but it's like both ways. Because I think that also like those indigenous communities themselves have a lot of knowledge um, and history about some of these things that could actually inform <laughs> what the research that we're doing and the practices as well. So that's something I think that's that's actually really important for sure. Um, all right, and let's say, unless you had something to add, I'll go to the next question. All right, so um, this question here is, is when we talk about increasing biodiversity through polycultures, sometimes that means growing non-native species, um, which are not naturally inclined to grow in the region. And I think this, this, this refers to polycultures, but it could also be in hedgerows too. I know that I've seen hedgerows where they're, it's like, well, this is not a native species. Um, and sometimes those species can require extra water and energy. Um, what does this mean for the ecosystem? Can we, like, what are your thoughts on this? Can we grow non-native species uh, 
sustainably in a way that it's still increasing biodiversity, but it might have other implications for like that, that natural biodiversity. This is actually a question I always pose my students too, because I'm, it is because agriculture is so much, we bring in species from elsewhere, you know, because of the big Colombian exchange. Uh, you know, if you look at an African landscape, there's only a little bit of uh, sorghum and a few things, but you know, so much came from Asia, it came from uh, South America, so corn, soybean, you know, so many species. So in fact, um, even somewhat beneficial uh, perennials like mangoes, but then eucalyptus from Australia has done, you know, devastating things to water cycle certain places. So I think it's something to be very, very careful of, but to also be aware that I guess I stand on the side of, we are introducing species everywhere. And so if we're very careful, we, there sometimes is a missing functional group that really does need to be part of a hedgerow and it won't necessarily be a native. And after all, natives are moving and changing. This is not things that are set in this pristine past. We are now in this new world. And so we have to be careful, but we have a, a job to, to try and do something because I am an agriculturalist. So I, I do believe in trying to do the best we can. Um, so happy to have other people coming. Yeah. Idea, Matt, do you have any thoughts on this piece? And Matt, the hedgerows that you work on, are they primarily native species or are there some non-natives as well? Um, yeah, so the, the planted hedgerows that are um, impl implemented by Delta Farmland and Wildlife Trust, I believe they're mostly native species. Um, so we try to go for um, more native flowering species, but then um, for anyone who's been to Vancouver or BC before, there's quite a bit of Himalayan blackberry that just grows everywhere. Um, so that quite often takes over some of the hedgerows if you're not maintaining it. Um, and that also is, you know, it's a huge problem for um, spotted wing drosophila, which loves to breed um, in that Himalayan blackberry. Um, so I guess that's an example of a non-native species that becomes a problem in the hedgerows. Um, but I, I think I would, um, I, I would be on the same side as Sig where um, obviously there are uh, there, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of differences in the non-native species that you could be planting, and if you're planting something that fits with the natural ecosystem that you're in, then I think it could definitely be done sustainably. Cool. Great. Um, so we've talked about kind of these different ways to promote biodiversity, agrobiodiversity. Um, Michael Wolf, one of our attendees is asking, does anyone have key examples of municipalities, maybe other um, places that have enacted really good policy to support biodiversity enhancement on agricultural land? Um, or do we have, I mean, this is, some people might call these bright spots or like examples of like, here's what we could do um, and we need to do more of that. Can we come across those sorts of examples? Well, our our, port, our partner organization, Delta Farmland and Wildlife Trust, they do a lot of this kind of work. Um, so the grassland set aside program, that's something that they have implemented in the in the Delta region. And it's it's um, basic. The basic idea is that um, they will pay farmers to leave these agricultural fields um, unplanted. And it provides all this habitat for not just insects, but also for birds and mammals and a lot of native species in the area. Um, so I think that's a great incentive for farmers in the area to plant these um, these habitats that are really beneficial for just biodiversity in general. Others, are, are there other examples? Wow, that's, that's impressive. Some of the most expensive land in the world and yet you're seeing that, <laughs> that's great. Uh, so, you know, I, um, I think in Michigan, one tiny example, which is I've seen uh, some areas where drain commissioners, so these are people in charge of keeping the drain clean of all this, you know, eroded silt off agricultural, have been uh, been um, shown all the information. So they decided to stop paying farmers to go to cover crops. And many farmers are growing these huge cocktail mixes, which is kind of fun. 
Um, and because, and so it's really nice because it's very local and it's, there's also some amazing efforts by Nature Conservancy and the Saginaw Valley and USDA uh, in particular valleys, but they tend to be targeted certain places. What I like about the drain commission mo model is that our drain commissions throughout because Michigan is mostly was originally wetlands. Now half of those are drained. So there is these people that are in charge of these water uh, ways and wouldn't it be nice if we could see the link back to the to the non so-called non-source point pollution, which has been so hard to regulate in our capitalist society, in other words, bombing. So that's kind of cool, but very small scale. Um, another one is the Good Food Charter, which the Center for uh, Regional Food uh, here at Michigan State has worked on, a very activist group, not in my department, <laughs> much more activist than that, um, much more about uh, how do we promote policies in Michigan, for example, of uh, supporting hospitals and schools and buying local food, making more local food markets, you know, the growth of farmers markets and these other kind of local foods. So I'm very excited about that too. My apologies, yes. there's yard work going on outside my building. So when I'm talking, you might hear some leaf blowers and things <laughs> like that. I'll try to keep muted. Ida, do you have any examples from your work and in California about yeah. places that have, yeah, or? Policies. I think there's a lot of resistance where I'm working in terms of like there's a lot of policies that for like sustainable groundwater and there's been a lot of um, pushback on that and some of those sort of policies are you know trying to you know push land away from agriculture but at the same time there's been um, a, a healthy soils uh, initiative here in California and so um, this program specifically like pays farmers to sort of implement healthy soil practices and you know this isn't necessarily biodiversity you know, above ground, but I mean, interesting above ground diversity, but mostly for improving soil health. And I think it's been successful in some part. Um, and I think more and more farmers are being able to access their resources and, and in negatives in some part, because sort of understanding which practices um, will be part of this and who can implement them is hard. But yeah, there's a lot of pushback here, especially in the region I work in. Right, all right, fair enough. Um, one question that I had from your guys' work too, I mean, you've touched on this a little bit, is the fact that as, and I, I haven't talked with farmers as probably as much as all of you have, when you're increasing the biodiversity in the crops you're growing or in the landscape, all of a sudden that means a lot more knowledge is maybe needed by the producers to know how to grow these different crops, how to manage them, how to like, uh, to understand the biodiversity that's in their landscape. Do you, have you experienced pushback on, from farmers on, on that piece of things? Like, oh, it's just, it's too much work and I can't keep that all in my head to do all that. Um, or is that something that like farmers are not, they're not thinking about that. They're excited to, to grow new things and, and learn like that. Or is it, and maybe there's a diversity of views of, uh, depending on the farmer and the background as well. I think there's totally a diversity. That's something I always try to like bring up is that a farmer is like not a monolith, right? It's not, if you're diversifying, you're going to do this. There's, there's these, these are real people with real personalities that are going to choose things. But one thing that um, I've been working with uh, Kathy DeMaster, um, we did some interviews with some farmers, not in the area I've been working, but more in the Salinas area. And one thing we find that's really interesting is that some farmers just want the challenge. Like they just want to take on the challenge. They're like, you know, we used to be a monoculture conventional, but you know, that got boring. And so this is what we want to do now. Um, and that's been really interesting to find, right? It's just, sometimes they are motivated by values of like the environment, but sometimes they just want the challenge. And I think that's something I always like sort of mentioning is that, you know, these are farmers with personalities, you know, these are, um, it's not, they're going to make decisions sort of across the board, but that's one that I have found uh, really interesting. Um, and you know, one farmer was like, uh, even like breeding or uh, rearing his own like beneficial insects. And it was just like, had this whole like, and we were like talking and he's like, oh, come here. And he had this whole setup where he was trying to rear beneficial spiders or something like that, spider mites. Or I forget what it was, but it was something just like wild. Like he's like, I'm not gonna buy them, but he just really loved the challenge. So I know it's opposite in terms of your question you're asking, but just something I wanted to bring up in terms of like, one of the reasons why people might implement some of these practices. That's a, that's a great perspective. And yeah, they're, they're, they are real people. Sig, did you have something to? Well, I just love that because that's the greatest privilege 
about our work is that we get to be schooled by these farmers because they do they <laughs> they'll look at you and they'll say take off your sunglasses i want to see you now i want you to see this soil you have improved the soil in this area but you've never brought me that edible soybean you promised me an edible soybean i saw it there and where is it it's like you know they just hold you to account and they tell you what they're thinking about and you know, people talk about participatory, like this, this nice thing we're doing the farmers. No, 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 no. They're schooling us and we are privileged to be in that position. And who's going to make this landscape diverse? It's, it's very those who manage the land. So we should be in communication with them. Absolutely. All right. So um, given our time constraints, I think this next question is going to be our last. Um, this question is that we talked about plant, fungi, insect biodiversity. This um, question is around larger wildlife biodiversity, rabbits, coyotes, those larger species. How do we create agricultural landscapes that are also able to be used by larger wildlife? Um, they, they say they imagine it would be more difficult, and I think I agree too, but they're, they're wondering what would that look like, and is it possible? Do any of you have any thoughts on that? I So one one thing I've, um, again, uh, Claire Kremen, who's at, at UBC, um, I feel like it with and I'm in part of the lab group. One thing I've seen like with her group and then other people, uh, it's it's just a really I work on like this obviously the small the biggest thing I work on is bees. You know, I work on very small things to the microbes. And but in the group, there's uh really great people and beyond that, like one is sort of like fences. Uh there's like really good, like really cool reviews that came out this last year about like fence ecology, like fencing up ranches or not, and how that allows movement of wildlife. And there's really cool work coming out of uh, some students, grad students in the lab. I don't think uh, some things are published yet, but other people have in terms of like allowing movement across different parts. Like I have a friend who works on hyenas across ranches in Eastern Africa, you know? And so, and also when another grad student in Claire's lab is working on frogs um, and working on how, and this is in Ecuador, looking at like this, which types of farming systems allow frogs to communicate to so sort of the soundscape of, far, of, of frogs across agricultural systems. So there's a lot of work there, really cool work um, um, happening and perhaps harder, but it's difficult to say um, because that's not the work I do, but really interesting work. Any other thoughts from either of you guys? I would say for one yeah. thing, uh, sorry, Sig, were you gonna say something? Yeah. Well, I, was I, just just gonna say, I was just gonna say like, there are some groups that are working on, if you think about like the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative in North America, they work in places where there's ranching and agriculture and they're working on kind of that large scale connectivity. And yeah, it's things like building corridors and, and protecting things like riparian areas and streams that actually provide the, the movement of those large animals um, across agricultural regions. Sorry, Sig. So. No, I think that's, that's really important what you're sharing. Yeah. yeah that, uh, I, I do want to say that, um, you know, we shouldn't forget that although it's not the only way, and in fact, I think it's oversold, but the certification like the coffee that's bird certified and, you know, some of these other efforts that are trying to consider, and again, organic agriculture, reducing pesticides in the environment can go a long ways towards insect biodiversity, which is important for bird biodiversity and these efforts around changing mowing patterns and so on so we can protect birds. So I, I think they shouldn't be forgotten um, because they're they're really important. And some that are really the charismatic flora and fauna that like birds that, that really get people going, we should really be focusing on that. So that's, that's part of how we've been able to save old growth and other things. So why not certain types of agricultural landscapes that promote these types. There's certain animals that are well suited to them. But again, I think we need both trees and intermediate life forms as part of the solution. Obviously we need mosaics and, and all the other work, but there's some areas that have been somewhat overlooked, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. and people get really excited about birds and those larger animals too. So <laughs> I get excited about parasitoids and insects too, Matt, but maybe I've, an exception sometimes. So, um, so we're ba basically near the end of the um, the webinar. I'm just if there if either any of the panelists have any final thoughts, I'd invite you to just um, you know share them now. I'll give you a second if you have anything final. Well, Eddie, I just really appreciate your mycorrhizae because you know I'm a plant scientist, and so I really have always thought we've overlooked the fact that plants and their associated microbes 
microbes. So if we can diversify our farming, we diversify the microbial. There's all this talk about soil health, like it was this, or inoculations as if they were generic, like you can just add a technology and fix it. It's the diversity that will fix the below ground diversity too. So we shouldn't forget that that's part of the uh, whole story, just because we can't see it. But 100%. plants that drive that and people forget that they really want to focus on, you know, some sort of magical measure microbial, whatever it's, it's the, <laughs> all the activity occurs in those root systems. A hundred percent. They're symbi they're symbionts, which is that depend on plants. And so um, we can't expect them to just, you know, inoculants that have like five species of AMF versus the hundreds that there are to work you know and and also diversify um i think 100 i really think plant diversity is key to sort of re restore re-enrich this this um these agricultural systems yeah i totally yeah i agree too um and especially just because we can't see it doesn't mean that it's not key or really important as well so so i know there's probably some unanswered questions um i want to thank everyone for sharing your time with us uh, keep an eye out for a follow-up email, which will address some of these questions and it'll share resources on what we've all learned today. I really want to thank the three presenters, Matt, Ade, and, and Sig. Fantastic talks. I found that they're really interesting. Um, yeah, I might follow up with some of you about some of the stuff that you've presented as well, because it's really, really uh, exciting work too. So behind the scenes for this webinar, I'd like to thank Melanie Cooksdorf, Maria Norton, and Mackenzie Dorsey, who have been like moderating the Q&A and like giving reminders to people to, to when their presentations are done, that sort of thing. Uh, this series is keeping going. So next week, please join us for an episode entitled uh, Organic Bi Biodynamic Regenerative, What Really Healthy for Our Soils. So focusing on that below ground um, stuff, the stuff we can't see as readily. And that's on September 2nd, so from 11 to 12.30 p.m. Pacific. And please let us know what you thought about the webinar. So after, I think, um, maybe when you log out of Zoom or afterwards, you'll be directed to a short survey about this session. And um, we'd really appreciate your feedback. We're always looking to improve these webinars. Uh, feel free to visit us at ubcfarm.ubc.ca. Check out around the Center for Sustainable Food Systems. Um, and finally, thank you for joining. And we really look forward to continuing the discussion with all of you.